So, so yeah, this is an interesting uh, topic. Uh, you know, any of us who have worked in operations have had those frantic moments where people are trying to like come up with reasons to explain what's happened, and hopefully by the end of this, uh, we'll get a better insight into how distributed tracing fits in. So I'm Adrian. I work in the Spring Cloud team, uh, which started actually to do like um, you know how to use like Netflix open source. Um, hey. Um, <laughs> okay, I will not touch that. Okay, I'll type with one hand. Uh, no. All right. Well, you can watch me dance today. Okay, this is going to be very interesting. All right, so, um, so right, and um, so I actually was working at, at uh, Netflix at, at the time too, uh, and uh, eventually found my way into distributed tracing um, when I worked at Twitter. And um, I'll get into like what Zipkin is and everything along the way. Uh, it's been an interesting journey to me and I love sharing knowledge because I don't have it unless people have shared it with me, so keep it going, right? So for understanding uh, latency, first thing is about how to understand our architecture. And so, uh, so basically, like we've seen some presentations, I think basically all of them have at least mentioned the word microservice or drilled down further into nano service. And, uh, and yeah, the idea that's common between all of them is that you know, your architecture is a graph of things and they're connected and sometimes uh, delays and problems or, or delays are problems and it tends to be toward, you know, between the edges of these components. And um, what, when we're having uh, issues or this, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna just hold my hand here and hopefully the dongle does not die. Uh, so, you know, when it's most relevant is, is it's when it's in our current architecture, we've got lots of dynamic things and you know, like with Meso schedulers, uh, nodes can come up and down, and uh, <laughs> like this. Uh, I think it might be because it's sitting on the laptop. Okay. All right. <laughs> So right, you know, we have these flexible architectures now, and what the current architecture, the one that was there, you know, when the latency occurred, is an important thing that we have to consider in our minds now. So, you know, it's sometimes we don't have the luxury of static deployments, static IPs, blah blah blah, and so one of the things is we want to know what our architecture is, but specifically when something interesting occurred. So to use like HTTP example, which is something I think most people can relate to, like. Uh, You've probably had a post request that's been slow. It's usually post. Post is the thing that all the nasty things happen in. And so if you're trying to like come up with the idea of, um, you know, or come up with an answer for the question of why it's slow, you know, you would first try to, you know, demarcate what it is that um, the post request is. And then you have to consider that there's two views of it, at least, um, which is, the, you know, the client view and the server view, just like any RPC. Um, you know, there's a, there's a sender and a receiver. So a client's uh, latency um, might not be reflected uh, in, in context unless you can see what the server's view of it is. So, for example, in this case, the, uh, the green color, which is something I, nice I do for colorblind people, is uh, saying that this request was, you know, less than, you know, one and a half seconds and um, that would betray the person who's complaining that it took longer than two seconds unless the person on the server was aware of that. So there's, there's some interesting context in like what, what, what view someone has of latency. Also, um, it's important to understand which parts of the operations are actually critical path affecting. So when you have this diagram, which, which has some washed out text on it, uh, the top bar is like the critical path from the client's point of view, it's a post request, and then these are some sub operations that happen along the way. And in this case, there's uh, if you could read what's being said there, it would say like wire send happens twice. And in this case, this is this is on the critical path that does explain uh, 
um, potentially higher latency than necessary. Um, and then on the other hand, you have an asynchronous storage operation that the server did and took off the critical path uh, for the client so that it could be released quicker. So when you see how an operation breaks down into its parts, you get a better understanding of that operation. Um, and in this case, it's not, a, it's not a very distributed context. It's just client and server, but it has more context than if you were, say, just looking at this, the server log and, and when one thing started and stopped. Um, the, the challenge here is that not all operations are relevant. Um, and if this graph was showing colors like I had intended, uh, the, the white blocks would say things like lock support and reference queue counter and all these other things that are happening in either your operating system or a virtual machine that may be affecting, your latency may not be affecting. And, and so sometimes it's, it's hard to pin down what, it, what exactly is latency causing. Um, and so, you know, one thing that we noticed, uh, especially in the BBC presentation earlier, is that, you know, service architecture isn't simple anymore. You know, we can't even say microservice, and we now have to say nano service and functions as a service and such. And, like, essentially, these diagrams I'm showing here are very unrealistic because not only do they imply a client server architecture, but they imply a single client request and a single server response, which, which is, you know, fast and fading. Um, we, have, we have the luxury of these more complex architectures because, to a certain degree, I believe that the deployment tools like the Kubernetes, the Mesos, all these you know, Cloud Foundry, all these other ways to deploy topologies are far easier than they've ever been. And now you can deploy very complex architectures without hiring wizards. Um, but you, know, you still need to troubleshoot them and figure out problems. So I think the challenge here with observability and, and distributed tracing as a subset of that is that you know, we, should, we should get to a point where we can um, you know, keep our skill sets for, for the operations and, and troubleshooting the, these environments on par with the tools that deploy them, ideally better than those. The, uh, these slides I'll post. Um, there's, there's a diagram which I think you can only see dots. But um, Adrian Cockcroft has a pet project called Spigo, which allows you to simulate architectures and have these nice D3 visualizations of what something might look like. And so that was a, a screen grab from that. So distributed tracing. Um, I think like, like all observability tools, uh, distributed tracing is like another way to, in another attempt to commoditize knowledge. And in this case, we're trying to collect these end-to-end -end latency graphs, which, which are going to give you a representation, like a causal representation, happens before type of representation for an operation as it fans across a network. And through this, you might be able to compare um, a uh, representative operation of a normal state with one of a slow or error state. And that could help you uh, understand um, you know, some, some of these outliers as far as like what, what was the cause of latency in those cases. And like all things, we have jargon in distributed tracing. Span is the most jargony one, in my opinion. And this is the thing that just describes that bar for how long a specific operation took place. And that's like one node in the tree. Um, span is uh, basically something that would say if I made an HTTP call and it came back, um, that would have metadata about that HTTP call that could help me redraw it in, in a way that looks like it happened. A trace would be, you know, all these in context. So it would be um, like a, you know, incoming call would be one span, and then it would fan out to five different requests to some services. Those each would be spans. The trace would be the collection of all of those together. Here's a, a hopefully readable thing on spans. And so usually you'd, you'd have at least a name um, similar to how you would name a metric. And um, it would have some context because these spans happen. Uh, it's not an aggregation. It's, it's happening on a discrete node. So it might have some metadata about the, the shard of the cluster that it occurred on. And um, 
perhaps some events of interest, at least boundary events like when something started and stopped, but maybe also some events like cache hit, cache miss, um, things that, that would explain latency. And like a lot of tools, uh, we have uh, dimensional metrics, I mean, sorry, uh, dimensional tags. So you could have um, things like, uh, you know, e URL or application ID or some, something about the platform that could help you query and group, group by later. Uh, I keep saying observability tools, some people call it telemetry, some people call it monitoring, but basically things that, that give you insight about your architecture. And tracing systems are a little unique, I think, in this space. Um, not just the fact that they're gathering um, graphs, like trees most of the time, but some, some systems do graph, like uh, uh, multi-headed graphs. Uh, but uh, they also have a very short retention policy. So if you look at logging and metrics, usually you have like long-term tracing system collect a lot more data. So sometimes the retention is only two days or so. So it's like, I'm gonna uh, troubleshoot something that's happening now. Um, and, uh, and one of the key concerns here is latency. Uh, I'll get into later that it's not the only use of tracing, but it's, it's a primary use case. So this is a neat diagram that looks mostly readable um, by uh, Peter Bergen, Bergen who uh, drew this up because a lot of times people have a question about like how does tracing fit into like normal metrics and logging. And one way to pin it down is that tracing has, a, has sort of a request scope implicit to it. So like when your server starts up, there's lots of background and bootstrap and, and other things that are going on in preparation to serve work. And if you think about most software components, even like Lambdas will have some sort of a life cycle that, that surrounds the processing. A trace doesn't really exist until a request, in it, request enters the system. So things that happen before it and happen after it won't necessarily be in the trace. So this risk, request scoped nature of it is fundamental to tracing, but it's not, it's not limited to tracing. For example, metrics uh, often have a request-based endpoint, although they're aggregated into like, you know, some, some sort of a bucket, whether it's average or P99. Um, and then logging, you know, a lot of times people will stain logging with um, you know, keys like trace IDs and request IDs and things. So they can, logging can be uh, request scoped as well. But it's more like what is the cardinal aspect and I think the, this uh, Peter Bergen did a good job with saying that, like essentially, tracing's request centricness is a nice thing that separates it from the other things. I think the structural nature, like the ability to do what happens before a relationship as opposed to just time, time correlation, is, is another interesting thing about tracing. So for example, uh, I think yesterday there was a presentation uh, at the end of the day where there was like a, a line going at the top and a line going at the bottom and, and like whether you could um, prove that uh, like a, an end state uh, could never occur based on, based on causality. And, and tracing does capture causality independent of timing. And so that's interesting, particularly if you're doing a lot of asynchronous work, it can help you understand what, what happened for real, what caused something versus something just happening to happen right before something else. And so that's, that's a neat thing and you can ask me later about it. Um, and, and the biggest pro tip about uh, tracing is it's not just for latency. In fact, in many sites, it's, it's, it ends up being a subordinate use case because people, uh, I think, I forget the, the exact quote, but one, one thing Uber said was like, understanding what the heck you just built was like the primary use case for, for tracing. Because you can get a, a visual a representation of your operations as they truly happen, um, it, can, it can give you a lot of understanding um, which, which otherwise is difficult to the, due to the amount of abstractions we use. So I know one of the um, Cassandra consultants, uh, consultancies, The Last Pickle, they use tracing as sort of a, a training tool because a lot of people tried to treat Cassandra is similar to SQL because it has CQL and you can do selects and things. But if you look at the what happens when you do a store and it does replication, it gives you a lot more insight into what's actually happening. What, what, what did you build versus what did you think you built? And then there's some other uh, side cases like 
finding out who's calling deprecated services. Like, uh, because there is a, a strict causal relationship, you can tell which service did what versus, you know, guessing on IP addresses. And um, I think the, the, from operations perspective, the triage is, is the most, well, in my opinion, is the, the biggest win. Um, when, you know, when you have a bunch of engineers in the room trying to solve a problem, we can come up with very creative uh, ideas about why something happened. Uh, maybe, maybe sometimes scapegoating things, who knows. And uh, having a trace which, which actually tells you what, what was implicated in what and what percentage of time was implicated, uh, you, can, you can really rule out the amount of time you'd investigate on one thing versus another. So for example, if you have a long tail uh, requests that took like three seconds, you might want to blame the database, but what if that only took 100 milliseconds out of that three? Should you really be spending that time in triage on that, that component? Tracing can help, help with triaging things. So Zipkin is a tracing system. This is a screen grab, mostly readable, um, from, from Zipkin. And what's happening on the top is that there's a bar that's probably longer um, than seen here, uh, representing the, the critical path latency. There's a column on the, on the far side there, which just tags the service names of who was implicated or who was most implicated with a specific operation. And then there's uh, individual operations, uh, you know, cascading down there. And so one of the things that's nice about traces, which you've probably seen in other metrics tools and APMs and things, is that they can give you a, a nice visual a representation of an operation and can, you know, you can, you can look at this and kind of see if something's happening parallel or, or serial or not. And it can convey a lot of information quickly. Um, Zipkin lives in GitHub. It was actually based on the Google Dapper paper, which which is actually which is a pretty good read. It's not a hard hard one to read. Um, and um, uh, Twitter created it in uh, 2012. It was actually a hybrid. It was between Dapper, but also there was a system that predated it called Big Brother Bird. And um, so, if you ever use a Zipkin tracing system, which I think some some of you uh, here have. You'll notice that like there's HTTP headers called B3, and B3 stands for Big Brother Bird. Um, but anyway, uh, it's I, when I was at, at Twitter in 2015, we moved um, Zipkin out of Twitter's org into its own called Open Zipkin, so it could be more led by the community um, than than the staffers. And um, this org includes tracers, which I'll get into. Um, Swagger slash open API spec for its, for its uh, API, uh, Docker stuff, um, different service components. And um, so it's sort of like a hub for, for a lot of the software. But the ecosystem is a lot bigger than that. And so, um, you know, we have some links on our website about where you can find other tools. From an architecture perspective, um, that worked okay. Uh, it, it really has a few things. One is, what lives inside the apps? Like, so if you, if you wanted to trace your things, um, then usually there's some sort of instrumentation which it works the same way as um, like monitoring instrumentation works. Um, and so this, instead of sending metrics, this is sending trace data out, out to the, in this case, Zipkin. It would send it over a transport like Kafka or HTTP or, or SQS or whatever or Kinesis, and um, you would so you would put these you know you would install um, tracing support into your applications. They would then schlep data into Zipkin world. Zipkin collector would process that and store it so that you can query it. And so it's it's not a very complex architecture really, um, and uh, that that parts that's parts neat because uh, it allows us to, to uh, swap some components uh, without a lot of complexity. Um, and that's important because tracing is new for a lot of folks. And if you think about things, if, if you have a new type of system that people are not used to running and then it's very complex, it doesn't really set people up for uh, success. So one of the things we did um, with Open Tracing, I mean, sorry, with Open Zipkin, 
was that um, the first thing we, we did was try to make it work with like MySQL and make, make things a little bit easier to access because formerly it only worked with Cassandra. And um, so this is literally a Docker Compose file which would run if you were to paste it. And um, you know, it shows sort of a minimum setup. It actually can be more minimum than this. Zipkin has an in-memory mode. Uh, so you can just um, Docker run. But uh, it will die. <laughs> so um, we've had some people start to request, like, can you do some memory management? I'm like, ah, I don't want to make a new data grid. But um, anyway, it, it, you can get started even without a database if, if you want to play around. And like, so the simplest way of that is you can, um, if you don't want to use a Docker, you can use uh, it as a jar file. Um, it's a Spring Boot app. So that, that works with you know, any given DevOps tool. And uh, so you can start that way. The main, way, the main thing that's interesting about um, how things work um, in, in Zipkin is that uh, the server is just accepting data that's sent to it. Like it's structured data, it's interesting data. But a lot of the importance is in the apps themselves and in the things that are actually collecting uh, information. This is called trace in instrumentation. So this is sort of like a 80 character wide diagram of how um, data might be recorded. And it's a fairly simple uh, process where something's intercepting like a client call, like an HTTP call in this case. Uh, maybe recording some lookup keys, which we call tags. Um, adding on uh, trace headers so that that same trace can propagate to the next hop across the network. Um, which is important because um, that's how you can get a graph. Um, the, uh, it's a parent-child relationship. So a span has a, a notion of a parent ID, and if the parent ID is null, it's the root request. So that data that links the parent-child relationship so you can redraw the tree later in HTTP world is propagated over headers. So like you would see things like uh, B3 trace ID and B3 span ID, and that's what those are used for. Um, when the request is finished, it just you know records the duration and then pops off an asynchronous request to to slip that over to to Zipkin. And the instrumentation is is written to not introduce uh, a lot of latency. Um, Zipkin itself has micro microsecond granularity because we were thinking of microservices at the time, and uh, but seriously, I, actually, it's a, uh, a lot of instrumentation are, are pretty efficient, and they, they, won't, um, they won't add uh, a lot of overhead. So they, these are made to be on all the time. That said, uh, they're not going to necessarily be something you want to capture 100% of traffic for, uh, especially if you have a large site. You can get, get by well with sampling like 1% of your requests. There's other things besides Zipkin out there. Um, but uh, HTrace happened after, after Zipkin uh, a couple years ago. And this is a special tracing system that focuses on data services. So um, it has the idea of like dual parents or well, any number of parents. So if you think about a data um, architecture a streaming pipeline, you might have like, you know, two different sources that converge into a join and then go across the network. So HTrace has built-in things for like um, uh, looking, you know, debugging why an HDFS operation was slow, things like that. There's a plugin to um, allow HTrace to send the data to Zipkin and try to encode it into its format. There's a, um, a uh, sort of library definition spec called Open Tracing, which has started up this year. And um, that's a, so if you're creating a library that does things like recording tags and things like that, then uh, you could use this, which, which aims to be portable across um, different in implementations like Zipkin. And some of those drivers are compatible uh, with, with existing Zipkin tracers. So Zipkin's been out since, you saw earlier, since 2012. There's well over a dozen libraries for PHP, .NET, everything. So um, compatibility between those is important. Um, the reason is is that if they're not compatible, then like your operation starts here and it has you know these two outgoing requests, and then it gets to this one node. It has no idea that uh, a trace was in progress, so it creates its own trace. 
somewhere down, and then you have like a confused environment where your operation is split. So um, compatibility is very important. We actually have a, a and the Zipkin IO website list everything that's compatible so that you don't um, run into that problem. Um, there's some I other interesting th work out there. Google Stra Stack Driver Trace is a tracing SAS. It's actually free. I don't know why people make free SASs. I'm glad they do. Um, but at any rate, if you wanted to not use like Cassandra or Elasticsearch or MySQL, you just wanted to use Google you could uh, configure this thing to schlep the data in, into Google uh, because both, both Google's tracing system and Zipkin are, are, were based basically on the same concepts in the Google Dapper paper. They're pretty compatible. So our data format is almost the same. So that works out pretty neatly. And there's, other some, there's some new things you might have heard about recently that are not so um, t tightly integrated with uh, Zipkin yet. Like so for example, Amazon has X-Ray which is their new tracing thing, which is quite compelling. But it just being out, we haven't, we don't have any like integration plan for that yet, but it should happen sometime soon. Okay, so now um, I'm gonna do a demo. <laughs> because I think it will show up better than my slides. So I'm gonna make this diagram happen. Um, browser to front end to back end. And this is gonna use two libraries. Uh, one is Zipkin JS, which is a uh, ISO. What's the name for the JavaScript thing that works in both browsers and Node? Isomorphic, something like that. Yeah, so it's it's fancy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then Spring Cloud Sleuth, which is uh, was originally just a you know experiment on whether people can spell Sleuth but uh, turned into uh, Spring Boot's uh, built-in trace instrumentation. So yeah, um, the Zipkin JS part, we're just going to instrument an index HTML uh, so that when it makes a, when the browser makes a, a call out to the service, um, that will be traced. And, uh, and then Sleuth is gonna ha handle the backend apps. So let's see. All right, so let me just, oh, I have to mirror my display. Hold on. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not going to see what I'm doing. Okay. All right. Can you see? Mostly? <laughs> okay, so in, good. That's not too bad. So this, this shows like my prowess of, of, of a JavaScript developer. So this is like a complete functional composition that um, basically just prints out something in text. <laughs> um, so browser, all browser is gonna do is it's going to call localhost 8081 and whatever that thing spat out, it will also spit out. Uh, and if it has any problems, it will print an error to the JavaScript console. And um, there's some setup stuff, um, like choosing what tracer I'm going to use, and and I've I've um, put that in. Um, you know, I, there, there's some helper classes for this stuff. Recorder.js, for example, it says that find Zipkin at port 9411 and batch rep batch record it to its endpoint. So. There's, there's some things here. These demos are, are out on GitHub and I'll have links to them. So firstly, um, I have to do NPM stuff, but since I don't want to rely on, on networks right now, I have already done that. And I'll just browserify this thing and I come up with like this super nice readable bundle.js. <laughs> Um, which is going to just include all these all these uh, JavaScript uh, dependencies that I have, and then my beautifully drawn index HTML does this, <laughs> um, and then I have some services that I'm going to run, and I have front end and back end. Um, so front end is just going to call back end. So we have 
8081 uh, going to port 9000 slash API, which prints the date. And the front end, I'm saying uh, I'm baking in properties. I could have typed them on the command line. I'll set spring application name to front end, which that makes it uh, show up in Zipkin. I'm saying 100% sampling, and I'm fixing my port as 881. So uh, to get this started, I'll uh, start up a Zipkin thing. So Java minus star Zipkin. Oops. All right, let me get another Zipkin. <laughs> uh, see, I, let me try this one. Yeah, okay, that worked. So I downloaded that earlier, and I guess my network connection broke. So um, I've got Zipkin running, and then I'll start up a front end and back end server in Java. And then uh, so it's not a really fancy architecture, but it'll do something. And then I'll open the index.html file here. And it worked. Um, so if I look at Zipkin, um, I can do a query for traces. And I can see that this request took, uh, yeah, 265 milliseconds. And if I wanted to run it again, I could query again. And then I can find uh, that I've had two requests, and one of them's quite a lot shorter than the other. Um, both of them spent about the same amount of time in the back end service, 40-ish uh, percent. But um, one was, you know, an order of magnitude less time. And I'm sure folks here could make some guesses about why. Um, if anyone wants to take a guess, you can. Uh, but, uh, but at any rate, this, this is a, being a local host, not using SSL, things like that. Probably uh, warm up time. And we can do some interesting things because, like, Zipkin is a service abstraction, so. The, it's doing things like passing headers that are compatible with different, different uh, stuff. So if we had somebody come into the network and say, you know what, I'm just going to rewrite this Java stuff in Node. So maybe I'll just run the back end in Node. <laughs> and then hit it again. And it's so much faster that everybody switches everything to Node. Well, I should hit it make sure it works. Yeah. And then... Find traces. So there it is. So less than a minute ago, when the node one booted up, it had a 25 second critical path. That was a back end, right? So back end, and now let's see if I hit it again. And find traces. Come on. It's a, it's a one second delay, and I'm just too impatient for one second delays. So, yeah, now we've got one that's about the same time. So, the warmed up one with the node backend um, versus the one with the Java backend. And I can, you know, click in here and see some metadata, like when exactly the client sent versus received in relative terms. This can be helpful when you're troubleshooting stuff. Um, particularly, the browser one is interesting because, the, you know, in this case, it's saying that the server received the request three milliseconds after the client did. So if you're like trying to troubleshoot what happened, um, you can see that there's like 600 microsecond delay between when the request started and actually sent the request. Um, those things can be interesting too. So I don't want to get too much deeper than that. I was just kind of like, here's what it might look like. So I will unmirror, and I have not been looking if anyone's been flagging me for time. So <laughs> I'm hoping that's OK. Ah, where's my own mirror thing? OK. Right. Dude. So uh, 
my wrap up here is that if you're if you want to experiment with tracing, and you're not using a tracing system already. Um, there's we have a lot of example code. Uh, we have some for Python, uh, Ruby, Go. Uh, you saw the the Node and the Java ones. Um, there's some C sharp programs too, and and just send like use a local server if you need to, or just use the MySQL or one of the Docker or the Kubernetes deployments, and um, and you know as you as you mature your infrastructure, um, just like the BBC presentation was like you know, talking about like testing whether your thing will scale or not, and then only optimizing when you know the feature is going to be successful. Tracing is a feature. And so you can start simple, and then you can do fancy stuff like Kafka and advanced sampling and all these other things later, um, because that way you can learn the concepts, make sure it's going to be successful, at least you know what's going on. And the other important takeaway I think, which I didn't mention too much, is like the impact of this being open source. So um, you know we have lots of uh, people involved, uh, lots of experience. It's not a new project. It's been out since 2012. Um, we also use this thing called Gitter, which is sort of like Slackish, and um, there's there's a bunch of people there. That's where you get support from. Um, so if you have any 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 struggles, interests, or or comments, that's a good place to go. And uh, I I hope this was helpful. And if you have any questions, uh, bring them in. Any questions? I've got a question. Um, from your experience, having worked around this stuff, generally, what's is there any clusters of things that's, that doing uh, this tracing has often revealed quickly um, that people don't see? Yeah. So the question is like, what type of things are what what are common experiences when people start with tracing? What does it reveal more like? Uh, so, for, firstly, you get like these happy tweets where people are like, "I found four latency bugs." And, uh, like, there's an initial spike as soon as someone sees their uh, the way applications are are, are wired. Uh, some things that are common are like um, accidental calls to services. Again, these abstractions. Sometimes people are like, I think it was Groupon once that had uh, when they first started doing tracing, found that they were hitting a, a service which had no relevance uh, to be in the critical path. The result wasn't even being used. It was just, just pure overhead and no, no value. And so, um, so that's that sort of thing. Uh, there's some low-hanging fruit there about just what parts of the operations are, are uh, unnecessarily serial, or you think, it was, you think it was parallel, but it wasn't, because some configurations uh, screw up just had it going one at a time. Uh, so those, those are, yeah, so re redundant operations um, uh, and, uh, you know, some misconfigur misconfigurations are, are probably the things that happen the quickest when people start tracing. Hello. Um, how would you use this in a system where there's a queuing system like RabbitMQ or SQS where messages first go to the queue and then workers pull it and when the the data isn't transferred in the in the headers, I mean how do you get those stuff across the system? Good question. So easy to propagate uh, trace context over HTTP because HTTP has headers. Um, not all message systems do. I think Rabbit does have headers. Uh, so, um, for example, Spring Cloud Sleuth, which uh, has some Rabbit stuff, uh, it will just, like for JMS, which is the Java messaging system abstraction, it will just plop um, like messaging encoded variant of the same headers. So I think there's some forbidden characters and it just uses different ones. Um, hard ones are things like Kafka, because Kafka has no notion of metadata. It's just a pure blob. And so sometimes, at worst, people will have to like coordinate an envelope format um, and you know, make sure that the both sides would be able to unpack, you know, your your uh, head, your like envelope that has headers in it, and to to pull the actual data out of it. So so it ranges like tracing is easiest in systems that have metadata, 
um, you know, somewhere, some place to put key values, and it's hardest where there is none, because when there is none, you need to do some sort of coordination, and coordination is hard in microservices, so. I believe you mentioned earlier that there's a wrapper for using this with ASP.NET. How would that uh, actually happen um, for basically using this in an ASP.NET environment? Uh, for .NET? So, mm. uh, so there are, um, so there's a few, you, few projects um, and uh, one of, you know, some of them live at the HTTP layer, like there's Owen middleware um, uh, and then there's, there's another which is just uh, an HTTP abstraction. Um, which would have common uh, capabilities with regards to like uh, where you would uh, measure things, and then there's just a library which you would handwrite yourself. Um, so if you look at the Zipkin IO's existing instrumentations page, it will have the the link to a couple of the .NET libraries, and they would get into it a little bit more specifically. I fear that I don't actually know much about .NET. In fact, I tried to. I just installed .NET Core this afternoon, or well this morning, uh, in anticipation to try to start um, becoming more smart with regards to that, but you caught me. I don't really know much about it. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, is it, do you have examples for deploying Zipkin in a highly available fashion, or would you have to rely on Cassandra and other things like of that nature? So, I don't know where that voice is coming from, but okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, the high availability. So right, I think most who are doing uh, high availability, high availability for Zipkin itself, yeah, yeah it does it does uh, boil down to the data store. Uh, so if you think about it, um, all of the applications are are reporting asynchronously, or there's a bug. And so they will, they will eventually schlep the messages onto a queue or they'll use HTTP directly. If they're using HTTP directly, then they would hit like a Zipkin server uh, cluster like you, you might have done with, with whatever your favorite load balancing approach is. If, if you're using like Kafka, it would just build up on a queue that Zipkin consumers would drain. Um, so uh, most, I would say the more available setups usually have someone with some sort of like either Kafka or Azure has an event hub and then there's more recently uh, Kinesis, I think, um, where, where someone's, you know, draining, draining uh, you know, or someone being Zipkin is dra draining messages off of, off of a buffer. And then the, uh, if the storage is not available during those writes, then you have a problem. Um, so yeah, so, so it's the most the most used data store and high, highly available uh, setup is uh, Cassandra. Though in the last nine months or so, there have been a lot more people um, being engaged in the Elasticsearch side. So um, I would say that um, the most important thing for availability is the availability of your apps. So. Um, you know, in, in a lot of cases, people turn to Kafka or some other buffer to make sure that the, the data gets out of the apps onto somewhere reliable. Um, but there's there's a lot of trade-offs. Like, so for example, if you're using Kafka, Kafka has a relatively thick library, which may or may not conflict with your apps. Um, so, um, so yeah, our architecture is a little bit hard. Uh, if I try to just boil it down, um, the most stable configurations that are used in the higher scale environments are almost always Kafka with either Cassandra or Elasticsearch. Uh, if you're sampling part of the traffic, uh, what is the best strategy to decide which uh, calls get uh, the headers or not? So the question was like, um, all right, when you're doing sampling, you're essentially choosing what to drop. <laughs> and I mean, f first off, I think the, one of the th interesting things about setup is that like if you think of, of your tracing system, you know, you've got a reservoir of trace data and you know, what you put into it should have value. I mean, one of the problems with observability in general is like 
how, what percentage would you ever read back that you write? And you know, th there is a cost there. Um, so configuration uh, before sampling happens is important. So you know, unless you really care about the performance of your static assets, don't trace those endpoints. Um, then you don't have to worry about sample rates for those endpoints. Um, when you get into per request sampling, um, this, like some of the libraries are better than others at, at managing that, but by and large Zipkin is a before the, most of them are, are before the fact uh, sample. So that means that you can't take into consideration whether it was an error or not in that decision. You can only take anything you know on the way in, inbound. That's because, um, you know, it, there's no coordination, but there's no coordination required uh, on the way back. And um, if you do do other things like um, uh, in, in consideration of responses, you would have to coordinate that. Uh, one approach that's growing now is to use like a Spark pipeline in between and just send 100% of the data into, a, into an intermediary like Spark who would collect, like maybe take a 30 second window and then make some decisions what to actually send over to Zipkin. So that's a very recent project. It was originally started by Pinterest, and it's called Zipkin hyphen Spark Streaming. It doesn't actually do this yet uh, in, in open source, but this is what this is one of the features it has. So like Spark would be used both for advanced sampling and also to like tee off data for something like Visceral or uh, another visualization tool that you might have. Thanks very much, Adrian. Cool.